the untold uh, i'm with you Heidi buzo and joining me today is uh, josh Kroshar, who is the political editor for the national journal he's also a weekly columnist and does a podcast under the name against the grain so the famous against the grain is all by josh and i want to talk a little bit about what you've been doing with the atlantic media you've been working with them since 2010 you changed many positions and i want to learn and have our listeners learn a little bit more about what you've been doing, um, you know, in, in terms of covering domestic issues um, and things relating to all of the topics we're going to be talking about today concerning uh, what's going on in our economy, uh, the coming elections, etc. First, thanks for having me on, on the podcast, Havy. Hey it's great to be here and uh, socially distanced or in person. It, it's good that we were able to, we were able to adapt uh, in, in this brave new world. Um, you know, I, I've always been a political uh, reporter. A polit I've covered elections and campaigns my entire career for over about 15 years now. Uh, and I've been with the National Journal for most of the, my career. I, I spent about four years at Politico uh, covering presidential campaigns, congressional campaigns. But, you know, I, I look at public opinion. I look at, you know, the politics is the study of public opinion. So every time I'm reporting or writing, or, or uh, doing the podcasts, I'm trying to get a sense of the pulse of the public, get a sense of what the mood of America or what the mood of a certain state or, or congressional district is like at any certain moment. Um, so, you know, I'm covering a lot about the presidential campaign right now. Uh, that's that's the most high profile uh, type of contest. Uh, and, and everyone's paying attention to, to what's going on between President Trump and, and Joe Biden. But I also pay close attention to the battle for the Senate, which is very much uh, contested and yeah, in play for the 2020 elections and, and even all the way down to, you know, the House races and state legislative contests. Um, we, 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 you know, uh, at, at Atlantic Media, uh, I used to be the editor in chief of the hotline, which is one of the preeminent uh, daily news publications that kind of aggregates and analyzes every little bit of, of political news. So that's where I got my start. That's where I got my, my training. I, you know, worked under Chuck Todd when he was editor of the hotline. Now he's He's moved on to, to bigger and, and better things uh, since then. Mm -hmm. but, um, that that kind of in you know in depth analysis has been my trademark, and, and now I write a twice a week column uh, at National Journal called Against the Grain, where we we, we uh, I, I, I kind of dissect all the latest news in politics. You wrote in uh, your latest um, column. You talked about how now it feels like two thousand and eight. And I do want to ask you about this, um, just because, um, I mean, you, you basically talked about how the Republicans are fearing to lose the Senate. Uh, the presidential polls are changing and maybe dropping for Trump, um, and the, Democratic, the Democrats are rising in the Republican um, states and cities. Um, tell me a little bit more about this, because I might disagree and have a few questions about that, but just I want to hear your, your perspective on this issue. Sure. Well, the, the biggest thing I look at when analyzing a campaign is what is the political environment? Like, what, what is the mood of the country in any certain moment? And right now, no matter whether you're a Republican or you're a Democrat or you're an independent, you're worried about the future. The economy went from one of the best economies that we've seen in a long time to one of the worst economies, a 15% unemployment rate and rising. Uh, people, are, we don't even know if schools are going to start up in the fall. We don't know if a lot of people have been laid off from, from their jobs, have uh, been displaced from their place of work. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety in the country, and people don't feel like, if you look at the polling data, people are less confident that the country is, is on the right track. It has, you know, it, it has just little to do about the president, just the atmospherics of, of, of the environment right now. And when you're looking at a presidential election, when you have a president, running for re-election, the president, the buck stops politically almost all the time with the president, uh, you're responsible for the outcome, you're responsible for the, for the leadership, you're responsible for the results of, of that campaign. Uh, and, and, and when you look at, you know, the election heading into November, uh, it's really tough for a president facing a, a recession and a president facing a, a really significant health crisis that doesn't seem to be alleviating it's really challenging to win a second term with that type of environment. And, uh, you know, Joe Biden is not necessarily the strongest uh, Democratic candidate, but this is not an open election like it was in 2016. In 2016, it was the Democrats that were in power. 
the Democrats were in charge for eight years, and it was essentially an open election where both candidates were trying to win win the presidency without anyone running for re-election. This time, you've got a sitting president who, who who's basically going to take the credit or the blame based on how things are going in the country. And right but isn't now, that exactly not- where is the difference between now and 2008? I mean, aren't we comparing apples to oranges here when we're talking about a, a disaster, a pandemic that is global, that is unprecedented, and comparing it to what happened with the economy in 2008, which was happened to different reasons. Um, now, I mean, we're not going to compare what's happening now to 2001 and 9-11 because this is a, a bigger disaster that we're dealing with today. Um, it's, it's also comparing apples to oranges, but I mean, don't, don't we expect that we have more people coalescing around our leadership, that we are faced with something that is basically completely outside of their responsibility and it's everybody is confronting at the same time? Well, you know, 2008, you had the Great Recession, the banks, you know, started to collapse, and, and there was real question over whether John McCain was sort of uh, steady enough to be, I mean, he, he had to deal with the, the baggage of George W. Bush, uh, who, was, who was leaving office after two terms, but there was a lot of, lot of doubt that McCain was really, uh, he, you know, there was a moment where he said the fundamentals of the economy are strong during the worst of that Great Recession in 2008. And President Obama, or candidate Obama at the time, ran an ad, 30 seconds, all over the country, running back that soundbike at, at John McCain. And McCain's numbers dropped like a stone, and so did the Republican Party's numbers. Now you're seeing, um, you know, examples of the president saying everything's fine, we should go back to, to work, open up the economy, uh, not really, I think, reckoning with the, the seriousness and the sobriety that, that it takes for a leader at this moment and, and all you have to do is look at the public opinion polls. You know, his, like you said, Havy, you know, usually when you're a, a president or a leader in a crisis, your numbers go up. Usually you look at, look at uh, Boris Johnson in England. You look at the governors, uh, Republican and Democrat in the country that have seen almost all of them, their numbers going up to, to historically high levels. Uh, you know, even it doesn't matter what party you're from. Usually you get a bounce because being a leader in a crisis, generally the public looks to that leader and trusts them even if they don't agree with them on certain policy uh, levels. Uh, the president, his numbers have either stayed the same or gone down a little bit um, since, since the pandemic. It's pretty unusual for that to happen. Um, and for me, like, if you can't take advantage of a, you know, if, you're, if people don't trust your leadership in a crisis and you can't get the same type of bounce, the same type of momentum that most leaders do, that is a glaring red flag, I believe, for the president's re-election chances. I saw in another post today that actually the numbers are sustaining. They're the same. They're not really changing as much. Uh, and they're claiming that Trump is not really losing uh, the numbers uh, currently. But I mean, I do want to talk about my own personal experience from people who were very grateful for the response that we've seen from this administration. Uh, a friend of mine who's a business owner, a small business owner, a minority, not a supporter of President Trump. It, but she was very grateful to see the fast movement of the federal government, of the administration helping small businesses. So, I mean, we do see people kind of changing their minds, just me uh, kind of observing and talking to people who were not supporters of this administration, having now a change of heart. And I I think this is a a developing issue. Um, But do you think the Republican Party should sound an alarm at this point? I mean, look, nothing that is ever set in stone. I think, look, in one step back, public opinion of this president is as divided and, and as, you know, partisan as it's ever been. I mean, people still support the president, even if they may, some people who are Republicans may have lost their jobs, they still, most of them are supporting the president. Even, even a pandemic isn't changing a whole lot of views. I will say, though, that before the pandemic hit, the economy was actually doing quite well. John, president Trump, his numbers were higher than they had been throughout much of his presidency. So, you know, they did go down. They took a, they took a tumble since from where he was in February, you know, right before the pandemic hit. Now, he's been lower, I think, if you look at the whole presidency. He's been, you know, kind of stuck in this 40% to 46, 47% job approval range. But, you know, he the, a lot of people like him no matter what. And, 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 and frankly, he has a floor of loyal supporters that is that's going to sustain him and help him even in tough times. The problem is that the more you play to your base, the harder it is to win over people on the other side, and the harder it is, 
you know, for the remaining persuadable number of people, if, the, if, if, if some of your friends, like if their small business can't open up or if they don't get the money from the, the, the federal programs that have been set up, they're going to probably go against the, the party in charge. They're going to go against the president. There are a lot of people that President Trump won over in 2016 that may not have liked him personally. They may not have thought he was amazing, but but they thought he was better than Hillary Clinton, or they thought that he's actually done a pretty good, you know, his policies, you know, appointing judges that are, you know, more more traditional uh, in nature, you know, doing doing tax cuts, the kind of Republican policies that a lot of people like, you know, they were kind of sticking with Trump. I think this crisis has really put a whole lot of pressure on that coalition of Republicans and people who may have, you know, had their questions about the president, but agreed with some of his policies. Some of them are, you know, thinking that they may, may have to reconsider and, and may end up voting or staying home or voting for another candidate this, this, this election. Mm-hmm. What do you make of those um, new ads by uh, the Trump's campaign about the mental state or mental health of Joe Biden? Um, you've talked about the fact that he's losing um, like senior uh, support. Um, but isn't it concerning to see Joe Biden struggling to answer two or three questions in a row without messing up a point for getting or saying something completely irrelevant? I mean, this is the president of the United States that's going to be serving for a four-year term. Isn't that concerning? So Joe Biden would be the oldest president elected at, at 78 at, at the time of inauguration. So that is, I think that is a, a concern among some voters, no doubt. I also think that President Trump isn't necessarily the best uh, candidate, the best person to throw those attacks at, at Joe Biden because he's made his own kind of embarrassing flubs uh, when he's been doing these briefings about the corona. So he, but there is a, a difference between being embarrassing and making like statements that are not typical for a politician uh, and completely be um, unable to process information and respond. I mean, this is... Yeah. Well, I can tell you that, that the day that the president said you might be able to use bleach products to uh, tackle the coronavirus, his advisors were apoplectic and his numbers started to take a really big tumble and then they canceled the briefings that the president Mm -hmm. has done so you know biden has his vulnerabilities one of the strengths of biden though is his weaknesses being an old white guy are kind of the same weakness that says things that are kind of off the cuff i mean trump trump does the same thing and so he kind of you know you could say that biden's weaknesses are neutralized by trump's weaknesses they both have similar weaknesses and they're older white guys who often say things that can be ridiculed. Um, you know, the senior issue is an interesting one. I hate, I mean, you know, it's fascinating that Joe Biden was the candidate of seniors among Democrats in the, in the primary. You know, the reason, one of the big reasons he won the Democratic nomination, despite all of these issues at the debates and the fact that he, he's been a little slower than he has been in the past, it's because seniors liked him. He got the senior vote in, in the nomination and he held them uh, throughout the whole campaign. And, you know, I think part of the reason why Biden is doing well and doing better than Hillary Clinton did with seniors is partly because they remember him when he ran for president in 2008. They were, he, he ran for president and he was the front runner at one point in 1988. And, you know, um, we're kind of in this nostalgic moment in our country. I don't know, like if you're on Netflix, you see these TV shows that are remakes of what you saw 20 years ago. And you see these movies that are, you know, like Wonder Woman and you know, all these movies that they're making sequels that are from movies that were made in the 80s. I I think there is something of a nostalgic sentiment and the fact that Joe Biden has been around for so long. He was, you know, he was, he ran for the Senate first time in the 70s. I mean, in a way that's a disadvantage because he's so old. In a way, people remember him. He's sort of like your your comfort food. Um, He's the nostalgic uh, uncle that you remember from the past. And I think that's what, I mean, he is, the White House's own polling has Biden just doing really well with seniors, and Trump did really well with seniors um, in, in 2016. I also think the other reason, uh, though, is, you know, the, the folks who are at the most risk of the pandemic are people over the age of 60, 70 years old. And I think, you know, if you look at the, the approval of how Trump has handled the, the, the coronavirus crisis, you know, the numbers say that there's a lot of anxiety and a lot, a lot of disapproval. And a lot of that comes from seniors who have the most on the line. So I think, you know, that's another reason, I think, why the numbers 
um, among a really must-win group for the president have been going in the wrong direction. We know that Joe Biden is a center-left candidate uh, in terms of how you would kind of divide the Democratic Party that we're seeing being divided currently. Um, and uh, there are voices that are talking about the fact that Biden is being pressured to move to, towards the left. And we saw how he appointed AOC as, as a co-chair to his campaign climate uh, task force. So how do you view this and how much could that also alienate people who are traditionally in the center of the Democratic Party? The, the so Joe, I, I actually, Joe Biden has never been a centrist in the true definition of being a centrist. Being mm -hmm. like, usually centrists have centrist ideas. They're, they're, they're actually like, you know, the Bill Clinton wing of, of the Democratic Party had a whole package of moderate policies being tough on crime, you know, back in the 90s and trying to, you know, grow the economy instead of taxing a lot of people. I mean, that, those were actual policy ideas. Joe Biden has always been more of a guy who goes along to get along. He's a party guy. He does whatever the party leaders kind of t you know tell him, or he's kind of in the middle just because he doesn't want to piss off or tick off too many people. So mm -hmm. the Democratic Party has moved to the left, and you know I, I think that Joe Biden is going to have to answer and is going to have to deal with vulnerabilities in that coalition as people like AOC and Bernie Sanders demand certain policies, demand certain things. You know I think it's Biden's uh, responsibility not to kind of move to too too far to the left and alienate a lot of these these more moderate suburban voters that have been coming into the democratic uh, column i mean part of the paradox of having uh, the momentum of having a big big momentum at your back having support is that you have a bigger coalition of people to satisfy and the democratic party is now a party that's kind of a big party you have the far left uh, of aoc and ilhan omar and you know rashida Tlaib and bernie sanders and you've got you know, folks that are used former Republicans that are, have said that they're going to vote for Joe Biden because they just don't want to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, it's going to be really, in, in a way, Biden, he's good at, at working with people and good at kind of cutting deals and making people happy. But sometimes you can't make, you know, a socialist and a moderate happy at the same time. And, you know, I think his vice presidential, his running mate selection is going to go a long way to tell, telling us how he's going to govern, how he's going to treat the, the campaign. You know, if he, if he goes with someone like Elizabeth Warren, you know, even maybe Kamala Harris, who, who's pretty darn liberal, um, that, that may mean he's trying to move to where, where the left is. And it may be a cautionary sign to some of the more moderate Democrats that he actually may be more liberal as a president if he's elected. If he picks Amy Klobuchar, who is pragmatic, is, is someone from a, a swing state who's won over a lot of Republican voters, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a signal that he's, he wants to move the party to the middle. He wants to kind of you know, you know, undermine some of the left wing agi agitation that that's been going on in the party. So I really think that vi whoever he picks as as his running mate, I think I think it's coming down to kind of Kamala Harris and Amy Klobuchar. Uh, but I think if he goes Harris, he may be thinking more to the left. If he goes Klobuchar, he may be thinking more to the middle and how he governs. We are seeing a change in the in the situation with both parties currently. Um, but you know, you mentioned a. Uh, uh, point that is accurate, which is the fact that, I mean, Joe Biden also was the vice president of Barack Obama, who was the first to start moving and shifting the Democratic Party towards the left. Um, and um, now we have the Obama gate um, issue. Um, there are evidence. I mean, we saw that many of the former administration's officials did say that there were no evidence to implicate the president in his uh, um, campaign in any collaboration with the Russians. So what is really happening there in your opinion? I mean, those are uh, actual statements that we saw recently resurface. Yeah, I mean, I think politically, politically speaking, I don't think this is going to make a huge difference in the campaign. Um, you know, you always want to fight a presidential campaign looking ahead to the future. And Obama, as you know, and, I, and I've argued like you did, that he was a lot more liberal and a lot moved the party, as you said, farther to the left than any other Democrat in, in my lifetime. But, you know, you look at his approval ratings, you look at his favorability ratings, and he, he actually, they're as high as they've been in a long time. And I don't think attacking Obama or, or bringing up what happened with Michael Flynn, um, as unfair as it may have been, is going to move voters. I mean, and a lot of times it's people who are really on 
Twitter, on watching cable news that are following these stories intently. Most people right now aren't watching political news. They want to know, am I going to get back to my job? Am I going to, you know, be able to feed my kids? Am I going to be able to go out to, to walk, you walk in, and, and socialize with my friends um, without getting sick? Um, but isn't it concerning that there were some politicization by the previous administration to kind of change things? They, I mean, we had to, you know, Flynn had to go and be investigated. And I mean, this is basically um, a violation of law. If this well, did happen, I, I think we need to get more facts. I mean, we have an investigation that that Durham is doing, um, so we will have have some more uh, information to, to judge. Now, you, you, the Russians did it, you know, interfere. You have to, you have to look at the 2016 context, and the Russians had openly interfered in a presidential election. And at the time, there was a lot of anxiety uh, that that there was you know funny business going on with with the new administration. A lot of it may have been unfounded and exaggerated. Uh, and Flynn, you know, at the time also was uh, lobbying for the government of Turkey and didn't disclose that lobbying on, on his on his, you know, government forms. And that was also mm-hmm. raising some some suspicion um, and, and worry among both the Obama administration and other people in the national security realm. So, you know, th- there's a lot of the basically what, what, what a lot of a lot of Trump supporters are really honing in on is that they didn't think they really could charge him with anything. And yet they kind of led him to this interview and he, he you know, he, he lied. You're not supposed to lie anyways, but, you know, he kind of, you know, got himself in trouble and they charged him with something that, that was sort of on a technicality. But if you look at the larger picture, well, you know, the, the, the I think we'll learn more with uh, the attorney Durham. John Durham is investigating at the behest of, of the attorney general. So we'll know more information in the near future. But, you know, Flynn did, it's not like he was a, a good soldier. I mean, he, he was someone who you know, made his share of mistakes. He lied to the president and to the vice president. And he was lying about his contact with the Russian ambassador. It raised a whole lot of legitimate suspicion. It may have been innocuous, but, um, and, and the FBI may have overstepped their bounds. But there was a lot of good reason for the national security uh, officials at the time to be worried about what was going on, given the fact that that the Russians aggressively interfered in, in the in the 2016 presidential election. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to talk about our biggest concern today, with which is China, um, and we know that this administration, I mean, is, is confronting something, and it has been confronting uh, the Chinese Communist Party's violations of international law trade law, um, stealing technologies, etc. And it was the first administration to go ahead and do those things that many and, and all previous administrations did not uh, because there's a lot of stake with China because there's the, a lot of trade and business, etc. Um, first, I want you to tell me what do you think of how did this administration handle and continue to handle the big China question, which is a very big concern. And we know that there are so many, I mean, the loss, the devastation, and everybody, we're all going through an unprecedented disaster because of what China did or did not do, which is probably hide everything, maybe more. I mean, we know that there's something happened in China and that we're all now suffering because of it. But I mean, how do you view this administration handling the big China question, which a lot of other administrations probably avoided? I think you have to give credit to the Trump administration for recognizing that China is not a good actor and you know, relying on you know, so many American companies' products being manufactured in China uh, may have been good for the lowering lower in prices for the average American consumer, but it may not have been good for our national security, and it may not have been good for, for your average American worker. And, and Trump, the president, to his credit, uh, really identified that as, a, as an important issue. He talked about it in the last campaign, and, and it's been a big part of his policymaking as, 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 as president. You know, I think there's a lot of talk, a lot of criticism, and not a lot of, not as much action going forward when we're talking about dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, you know, the president talks about how he shut off travel uh, from China early on, but he's also praised President Xi when he's been trying to get something from China. He actually hasn't entirely been consistent in criticizing the Chinese government and putting pressure on the Chinese government for human rights violations. And certainly uh, with the pandemic raging around the world, you know, he's actually said during 
during uh, February, I believe, that, that, you know, she was doing a great job um, dealing with it and wasn't raising a lot of the criticisms that, that you and I have been talking about. So, you know, I think... But he did more than any other administration. We have to be clear. Even though there, you know, there's the kind of diplomacy going on and the nice talk sometimes, but tough action other times, this administration did... Well, one administration is dealing with the pandemic. I mean, I think, I think you're right on the China trade and the China, you know, the economic uh, relationship with China. But only one, one administration we can judge for dealing with China during the pandemic. And the president has been fairly inconsistent. He said... He's, you know, had some tough talk at times. He's also praised the, the president of China and said they were doing a great job um, during the height of the, the pandemic early on. So, you know, I, I think that, that Biden will, again, like, just like on, on issues that, you know, Trump is vulnerable on, or rather that Biden is vulnerable on, Trump has his own vulnerabilities. I think you'll see both sides kind of fighting over China, but Democrats have a lot of ammunition on things that Trump said about China, praising China, not being as tough as he may have uh, should have been or otherwise would have been. Um, but would but- you trust Biden on China? I mean, this is a very important issue. You know, the Democrats in general, when we were talking about foreign policy, there's a lot of shakiness there. There's a lot of, you know, let's go, you know, kind of focus on ourselves right now. Let's have a soft power. Let's talk. And, and you know, it doesn't really work sometimes out there. Well, the Democratic argument, I think you hit the nail on the head, Avi. Like, the Democratic argument on China is going to be being tough on China. You know, they're going to have a similar type of posture. They're going to accuse Trump of not being tough enough. And I think what you you really hit the nail on is, you know, they're going to try to make a case that we need to work with them to deal with the pandemic. We can't just afford to shut, you know, to call the names, to to say it's a Chinese virus, to to, to, to kind of, you know, that the to kind of exercise our bluster when we need to work, we need to figure out what this virus is. We need to work with the scientists in China to, to get a handle of what, what's going on. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you the, the reality on the ground. I don't know which is, who, you know, I don't have a strong opinion on which is the right approach, but I think it is fair to say politically that you know, Trump should have an edge on China. Trump has been ahead of the curve in many ways, and take, at least his administration has been aggressively um, positioning itself against China. Unfortunately, I think he's also given Democrats some sound bites, and he's made some comments that are there are in the other direction that the Democrats may use against him in this campaign. Um, talking about this issue, I mean, we see the media and how it's covering this situation, and we see some mainstream media, and we're both from the media world, covering and taking, for example, what the Chinese Communist Party is saying and their propaganda media. We know that there's no institutions in China. We know that there's no free press, there's no transparency, but then we are getting the information from our media um, basically as if whatever China says is a fact. Isn't that concerning knowing that we're all suffering from this and that there's no accountability and there's no transparency that's demanded from China for giving them, you know, everything they're saying, we're treating it as a fact. We're enabling this party to continue lying to the world, continue basically hurting the world. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure which, which media outlets you're, you're referring to, but, you know, I, I, I've been, a, you know, <laughs> been critical at times. Of, we can of name them, but like um, CNN, for example, yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that there's, I, I haven't been too concerned with how, I mean, I think there's been a, uh, an appropriately critical look at, 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 you know, at the origin of this virus from all the, the major uh, mainstream news, news, news outlets. So I, I haven't, ha- I've been worried about the media side. I, I do think that there's been a lot of kind of confrontational coverage, um, sort of hyped up coverage. And I think that it's, you know, when, if you're in the White House briefing room, I'm, I'm there trying to get facts. I'm, I'm there trying to get, you know, challenge the president when necessary, but I'm not there to make it about me. You know, I'm not there to make it about myself or my network. I, I just want to get to the bottom of the facts or, 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 or hold, you know, uh, the administration accountable with good questions. I don't think that I need, you know, I don't think it's about any reporter in the White House briefing room should be making it about the news, not about themselves. Do you um, think <laughs> this was, was the case? Do you? I mean, I could, I mean, we could, we could talk about instances where I feel like, you know, sometimes, you know, the media outlets, I mean, it's sort of a mutually beneficial arrangement between the president and certain media organizations where um, the president likes to attack the press. He likes to, and in fact, he works with some of the, he actually has a good relationship with certain people behind the scenes, and then he attacks them in the briefing room as fake news. 
Uh, but then I think of some of the reporters, you know, at times because they they want to be famous, they or you know they like they like having their moment in the spotlight can often you know overdo things and, and try to make it about themselves instead of about the news and, and about the facts. So you know, look, I I don't think pre- I mean I, I I've been very critical about how the president deals with the press, what he says about the press. You're always going to have good reporters. You're always going to have not so good reporters. You know, you're always going to have networks that are good and and some networks that maybe shouldn't be in the briefing room. But um, you know. Ultimately, I, I judge people by their individual, you know, merit, and I don't think the president really has has uh, done a good job dealing with the press. I don't think, you know, calling people fake news and 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 and, and attacking them the way he does is helpful. But look, I, as a reporter, I would hope that you kind of go above it all and just get get the facts and stick to your job instead of trying to, you know, play the victim card as you sometimes say. Yeah, and I mean, let me tell you, just watching and seeing people's reactions, even on social media, people are upset. They're angry because a lot of them are just sitting at home looking at the screen waiting to hear about, you know, what is next, what's going on. And and instead, they're hearing a journalist could just keep hammering and trying to politicize the questions to stare it towards, you know, the whole kind of anti-Trump question, you know, type of question, rather than, you know, talk about the actual issues that everybody at home is concerned about. I will say, though, I I should be clear that, um, you know, the president used those briefings to sort of hog the spotlight. I I wanted to hear what Dr. Fauci had to say. I wanted to hear what Dr. Burks had to say. I wanted to hear what the public health experts had to say over two hours. I think the president wanted to use that for his own political, uh, you know, interests. And, um, you know, and I think any journalist should be, you know, while I think there may have been some some, uh, you know, peacocking, if you will, um, from some reporters. Like, I, you know, you should be tough on, on, on the people in power. You should ask tough questions. It's just that, what, you know, it's just that my criticism is that, you know, you don't want to make it about yourself. You want to make it about the question. You want to make it about the issue. About the issue. I think that's the key word, about the issue. Um, lastly, I mean, just looking right now at where we at and the elections are in a few months, what do you see happening? <laughs> Well, like I wrote in my column today, I mean, I, I, I've talked to people at the White House, Trump White House, I've talked to people running and involved in Senate campaigns, and the mood is very pessimistic for Republicans. It, it's, it's, they see the polling that we all see, and, and they're very, uh, you know, they, they don't see things turning around. You know, well, now I think the best case scenario is that, look, maybe the summer we don't get a, a word, you know, maybe the, 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 the virus doesn't spread as much during the summer and maybe we don't, we don't get a huge second wave in the fall. I think school, whether schools open up or not is going to be a big test of whether we're kind of behind, this is behind us by the fall. If it's not, I think people are still going to be really frustrated, really aggravated. Um, so, I, you know, I, is it possible there could be a turnaround and, you know, the economy gets back on track by the fall and the, the, the worst of the virus is behind us? It's possible. Um, but I think, you know, listening to the experts, listening to the people who, who know the most about the science, they're not very optimistic. And, it, and if, if the economy doesn't turn around fast and, and, and the public health situation doesn't um, improve enough uh, but in the next few months, it's going to be really tough uh, for the president. It's going to be tough for Republicans running on the, on the ticket. Um, so, I, you know, I see, you know, I, I think the president is a pretty, pretty distinct underdog. Uh, against uh, Joe Biden. Um, I think he has a chance to, to win and incumbent often has certain advantages, but um, he's in a tough situation. A lot of it is beyond his control, but it's a tough, tough environment. It's a tough, tough deck to, to play with. Um, and the Senate, I mean, I, and I've been writing about this for a while, but, you know, you could be looking at a Washington in 2021 that's entirely run by Democrats uh, if, if things don't turn around in the next you know, four to five months. Oh, Joe Biden um, probably was not the best choice that the Democrats could have picked. I, I just don't see how he could be a, a person that you could rely on for four years, giving his um, situation and how he's responding. Uh, but I guess we're going to have to wait and see on that, Josh, and we'll probably be talking again closer to the elections. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today um and thank you all for listening for the untold with heavy buzo and i hope to see you again and talk to you and uh get all of your questions and to hear your thoughts about our podcast see you soon